Hello, everyone, and a really warm welcome to this webinar series where we will be discussing a number of topics that are related to medical cannabis. It's our hope that there's going to be something for everyone here during these talks. Today, we are starting with episode number one, which is going to be our first of many. Uh, and we're hoping to cover the basics that we feel people need to know about medical cannabis. We've had a lot of questions already coming in via email from you all, so we've tailored the content of this first episode to reflect that. By the end of this first episode, you'll have an understanding of what medical cannabis is, the history of the plant as medicine, plus how it works in the body, methods of use, and who is using medical cannabis. Each subsequent episode will cover different subject matter related to medical cannabis, and every episode will always end with a question and answer session. So to let you know a little bit about myself, my name is Barb Vermeulen. I've worked in the legal cannabis system as a patient educator and advocate for several years. I've developed patient care service departments and policy for licensed producers. And currently I'm involved at the clinic level, helping patients gain access and information and support on all topics that are related to medical cannabis. I can honestly say that it's really been a privilege as well as a great, great learning opportunity to get to speak to thousands of patients and hear your stories and positive experiences with regard to medical cannabis and the positive impact it's had on your lives. So I'm joined today by my colleague and my co-host, Jonathan Warinsky, and I'll let him introduce himself to you all. Thank you so much, Barb, and welcome everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you. As Barb said, I'm Jonathan Warinsky, and I lead the cannabis counseling team at Canadian Cannabis Clinics. Our counselor educators provide guidance to patients in our clinics every day in selecting and using their cannabis products. I joined CCC in 2014 and began initially by developing the cannabis counselor role. So I've counseled thousands of patients myself, and I now serve as a subject matter expert. I was a registered massage therapist for 17 years, specializing in pain management, and I've studied cannabis for about 25 years. Now, it's important to note that myself and Barb, as your hosts this evening, are not physicians, and we're not providing specific medical advice uh, during this webinar series. So let's get started. And we're gonna talk about the cannabis uh, plant basics. Uh, and cannabis likely originated as a naturally occurring land race strain in regions of say, Northern Nepal through to Northern Afghanistan. And land race means that it was not cultivated yet by people. So now people all over the world, of course, have cultivated cannabis and it's a non psychoactive cousin, the hemp plant for thousands of years. And it's now found on every continent except perhaps Antarctica. That's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, so as you mentioned, Jonathan, cannabis and hemp have been cultivated for thousands of years uh, for uses as wide ranging as a food source, uh, textiles like clothing and sales, and of course, rope. Uh, hemp rope is probably one of the most common uh, applications that people are aware of, of, of uh, hemp being used as. Uh, and now it's even used in heavy industry. Um, some automotive companies are actually using hemp fiber to uh, create automotive parts. So a lot of applicable uses. The history of using cannabis as medicine really dates far back in antiquity, and there's documented use in ancient Egyptian, uh, Chinese cultures. The oldest written record of cannabis usage is actually from Greek historians, and they reference the use of cannabis-infused steam baths for wellness. Uh, there are also surviving texts from ancient India that confirm that cannabis's medicinal properties were recognized and used uh, for treating a variety of illnesses and ailments ailments, including insomnia and headaches, uh, gastrointestinal disorders, and pain, uh, especially during childbirth. Uh, cannabis was also included in many, many medicinal products in early Western medicine as well, uh, here in North America and in Europe, prior to its prohibition in the early 20th century. What's really interesting is that the entire plant really can be used medicinally, but currently much of medical cannabis really focuses on the molecules that are derived from the flower of the plant. Uh, and that uh, flower is also often referred to as the bud. Uh, so now that we kind of know the basics of what the cannabis plant is and where it comes from, uh, let's really move to our next topic now, that being how, how does it exactly work? And maybe, Jonathan, you can speak to that. Absolutely. So with medicine, we speak in terms of active ingredients or what makes a medicine work in the body. If we take Tylenol, for example, the active medicinal ingredient in Tylenol is acetaminophen. And that's the same with most medicines. They have one active ingredient, one molecule. But with medical cannabis, it's very different. There are literally hundreds of different molecules in the plant. Fascinatingly, our bodies make molecules called endocannabinoids, 
And the only other major source of these cannabinoids is the cannabis plant. To date, there have been over 140 cannabinoids identified in the cannabis plant. And to picture just how this interface works in the human body, you can imagine a lock and a key. You can think of the cannabinoid molecules as little keys that travel through the bloodstream and fit into special receptors or locks on the surface of cells and affect the change of functioning of those cells and therefore their systems and organs. I, I've always loved the lock and key uh, example and I think it really helps uh, with patients to really understand how does this work within the body. And I've always found it so fascinating that we have this existing system, uh, the endocannabinoid system within us, and that really, as you mentioned, the, the main source of cannabinoids really just does come from this one plant. So it's, it's very fascinating to note that. So Jonathan, you mentioned that there are many, many types of cannabinoids and science, I believe there's over 140 now that are identified. Uh, and science is really just beginning to discover what the main function is of each of those cannabinoids. Currently, the main two that are most focused on medicinally, and the ones that you hear about the most are THC and CBD. Uh, and those are the ones that we're going to touch on today because, again, they really are the ones that, that are, are most commonly discussed. So THC, or Jonathan? <laughs> Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol. It's a long one. THC, we'll refer to it as going forward, uh, in basic terms, affects the brain, and it creates the feeling that people most often associate with being high. Uh, when using THC, most people tend to report an associated euphoria, a lift in feelings, as well as what you could probably describe as an altered state of consciousness. And this is what's often referred to as a psychoactive effect. Now, CBD or cannabidiol or cannabidiol, often you'll hear it referred to as, CBD doesn't have those same psychoactive effect. So it generally does not produce those feelings of euphoria and being high. Uh, CBD often is best described as working within the body. Uh, patients who use CBD products may report a relaxation of muscles, an easing of pain, increased mobility, uh, as well as an overall calming effect. And I think what's really interesting about CBD and exciting is that it's quite desirable for many patients, especially those who are perhaps new to cannabis, uh, who may be wary of and really want to avoid those feelings of euphoria, those psychoactive um, uh, response that THC strains often produce. Uh, now, because of time constraints, uh, we are really just touching on the basics today, mm -hmm. and we are definitely going to go into more detail into uh, THC and CBD specifically, how they can work separately and together, and we'll definitely be dealing with that in more detail in future episodes. So another important aspect to consider is what's also called the cannabis spectrum. And maybe you can describe that for us, Jonathan. Absolutely. So interestingly, cannabis is largely considered to have two main subgroups. One group is known as indica and the other is known as sativa. We can think of a spectrum with indica on one end of the spectrum and sativa on the other. Now, there are many strains or individual types uh, in each of these groups, and we could think of a strain of a uh, type of cannabis like a rose. Uh, a red rose is one type of rose. So there are many, many types of strains of cannabis. Now, the, um, the spectrum will have, again, the indica on one end and the sativa group on the other, but in the, in the middle, we will have countless uh, cannabis strains known as hybrids, and they will be sort of uh, uh, having characteristics of uh, either indica dominant or sativa dominant. Um, so most users will report that an indica strain will produce more of a sedating effect, whereas a sativa will give rise to more of an uplifting effect, although that is variable. Exactly. Uh, you know, and, and that description is, is a very general one. And again, um, yeah. very anecdotal. Um, those are sort of generalizations, again, that sativas are uplifting, indicas are calming. Uh, patients, interestingly, often will take a sativa strain during the daytime uh, because of its energizing properties. Uh, and again, an indica at nighttime. And as you mentioned, we have all of the hybrids in between that may um, develop sort of, characteristics um, have of each. different characteristics and display. So um, very, very interesting. And, and again, a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, 
uh, I would say, the ability for a patient to, with the many different types and strains of cannabis, to really identify and, and choose the types of cannabis that really help to best address their symptoms. Yeah. So I think another really important question uh, that patients ask us is, what is the difference between medical cannabis and what they may purchase in dispensaries or from the street or from a friend? Uh, certainly that's something we hear a lot. Uh, definitely all cannabis can have medicinal value, but the simple answers on this are quality control, accuracy of THC and CBD levels, and specific medicinal properties. Traditionally, recreational cannabis growers, they focused on prioritizing the THC content, the psychoactive properties, to increase the potency and those feelings of euphoria and being high for its users. Uh, over the years, strains uh, or cannabis can plant types, they've been selectively bred and developed by recreational growers for those very, very specific properties. Now, for this reason, CBD strains, uh, they're generally considered quite undesirable in a recreational um, cannabis, uh, simply because it does not produce that same THC high, uh, and in fact, may actually reduce and offset the effects of THC. Now, currently, true medical cannabis is really currently only available in Canada via what's called a licensed producer. A licensed producer is a grower, uh, essentially farmer or company, that's been granted a license by Health Canada to grow both THC and CBD strains of cannabis that is intended for medical users. Um, licensed producers must clearly label all of their products with the strain name, whether it is an indica or a sativa or a hybrid. Uh, THC and CBD levels must be lab tested, listed on the packaging as well. Uh, additionally, licensed producers are subject to frequent inspections from Health Canada uh, to basically ensure that they are growing and packaging and storing medication in an environment that is clean and safe and sterile. Highly stringent, as Very you know. Very stringent. As I know, I, mm -hmm. I actually have been uh, lucky enough to uh, partake in some of those inspections, uh, and I can certainly um, attest to the fact that they are, are, are quite thorough, uh, and they will sometimes come without warning. So uh, it's, it's good to know that there is some oversight there. Um, I also mentioned three important things, that being consistency, reliability, and safety. When you take any medication, you really want to be assured that it is safe to consume, that the product is labeled as what it is, uh, and then it will have the same effect every time. When you're using cannabis as medication, this consistency is really, really key. Uh, when you're addressing symptoms, patients really need access to quality, standardized cannabis products that are consistently available. And this is why sometimes purchasing medication, let's say from the street uh, or an unlicensed dispensary, it can be less than optimal because you may not have a guarantee of what you are actually consuming. Uh, just to briefly mention, there was a very interesting study done in Holland a few years back where there are are coffee shops where you can go and purchase cannabis and so they went to a, a wide selection of, of these coffee shops and they purchased um, uh, very specific strains from each one of them so they bought some blueberry cushion they bought some AK-47 and they bought some UK cheese uh, and they bought some ghost train haze uh, and what was really interesting is that when they brought it back to the lab um, in the majority of cases what people were actually buying was not even what they thought it was uh, so again when, when you're looking at, at the difference, um, medicinally speaking, it, it is really important to have that consistency. So now that we've kind of talked about the difference between um, uh, medical cannabis and, and other types of cannabis, uh, maybe Jonathan, you can take us through um, the methods of usage. For sure. And when we talk about medical cannabis in Canada, we're really talking about two main ways of using it. We can use an inhaled method or ingested by mouth. Now we can also use oils through the skin in limited applications, but by and large, it is either an inhaled uh, product or uh, ingested orally. So for inhaled product, we would recommend the use of what's called a vaporizer. It's a small device, uh, often handheld, holds a very small amount of cannabis. It's a very efficient way to deliver discrete medicine. When we use cannabis uh, via an inhaled method, the effects are going to come on almost immediately, literally within a few moments, few minutes. They'll typically last maybe one to three hours. So we look at inhaled cannabis as being a fast acting and short duration approach to the medication. Now to ingest medical cannabis such as an oil, which are so popular in Canada, 
Cannabinoids are extracted from the plant and combined with a carrier oil. So these oils can be swallowed or held under the tongue and some oils can be topically used. Regulated quality controlled oils are available for many LPs. They're easy to use. They can be administered with a dropper or a syringe insist, uh, ensuring a consistency of dosage. And generally, orally ingested cannabis will take anywhere from about 40 minutes to even up to two to three hours to take full effect. And then those effects can last for six to eight hours or even longer. Some patients prefer to use their dried cannabis to create their own oil or a can of butter. And these can be ingested alone or mixed with a food or beverage or even used in baking. And patients, um, and use these different forms of cannabis to best address their symptoms and fit their needs and their lifestyle. So often it comes down to, as Barb mentioned earlier, different combinations of, of products and different ways of using them. Absolutely, absolutely. And we know that there is so much interest in oils and edibles. Uh, we've received a lot of questions about dosing and how to dose oils. Uh, mm -hmm. And certainly we can and will be doing an entire episode devoted just to that uh, as well. So um, uh, hang tight. Uh, there's definitely a lot more information to come on that. Uh, now, I think one of the most important questions that, that patients often ask is, is, is medical cannabis for me? And that's probably the question that brought you here today with us. Uh, certainly there has been a huge increase in awareness uh, and patients are reporting benefits from cannabinoid treatment, especially with regard to using CBD. Uh, you may have a friend or a family member, you probably already do, uh, who has told you about their positive experience. Uh, we also see a lot of patients who come to us who are unfortunately at the end of their rope. Uh, where literally all other treatment routes have been exhausted. Mm -hmm. And I think what it really comes down to is, is a basic quality of life. Uh, many patients do report easing their symptoms so that they can return to activities and really just be more involved and active in their lives. Uh, independence is so important and the ability to do simple household chores, uh, increased mobility, spending time with family, um, even younger people that we speak with, being able to attend classes at school and focus on their education or their job tasks. It's so important. Um, we also too have seen that there really is an increasing focus on general wellness and there is a desire to move away from let's say invasive and synthetic pharmaceutical products that potentially carry some harmful side effects effects, especially when we are looking within the realm of opiates and strong sleep aids. Uh, there is sort of a, a, a um, movement as well and, and a viewpoint of using cannabis as well as a supplement uh, and part of an overall wellness regime. Uh, so I think that those are things that, that are, are, are really important questions and I'm sure again that you've all been asking yourselves. Most importantly, I think, and Jonathan can speak to, is who is using medicinal cannabis? Mm -hmm. And if we think about the patient demographics in our clinics, it's extraordinary extraordinarily diverse. We literally have people from all walks of life, from every age group, in every state of health um, as patients in our clinics. We do have high um, patient populations of folks over 55, um, which was kind of interesting to us in the beginning uh, to see that type of population develop. We also help to counter stigma issues and empowering our patients to lead in their well-being. We'll often say to folks, if you had kidney disease, you wouldn't feel a stigma about receiving dialysis and you shouldn't be um, experiencing stigma for using medical cannabis under the authorization of your physician. Exactly. Yeah. So we try to address that. We try to empower our patients. We see a lot of people with a lot of different conditions, as I said, from neuropathic pain, orthopedic and cancer pain, post-surgical pain, and much more. So many of our patients can lessen or stop using the likes of opiates, which is quite phenomenal. Now, patients who live with seizure disorders and wasting syndrome often get relief only from cannabis. We see people living with mood disorders as well as anxiety and depression amongst other mental health issues do very well. And medical cannabis can be incredibly effective in reducing inflammation, intraocular pressure, and muscle spasms to name but a few. And it can also be helpful for people with sleep issues, again, often lessening the need for um, other medications, which can have unwanted side effects, as well as interactions with other drugs. And speaking of which, the interactions with cannabis are generally relatively few. So the safety of cannabis as a drug is quite remarkable, really. Uh, and because it does not work the way opiates do, cannabis cannot physically produce the same type of fatal overdose as opiates can. So having said that, it's important to say that cannabis is not a panacea, and it's, it hasn't been proven to actually cure anything, but it does help a lot of people with an incredibly wide range of ailments and symptoms. But anecdotally, patients certainly report to uh, many, many benefits. 
So today we've taken you through the very, very basics of Cannabis 101, we'll call it. Uh, and yes, it is so, so much information. And that's exactly why we are embarking on this series, because there really is so, so much to talk about. Uh, we know that our next webinar is scheduled for July 4th. Uh, we hope to discuss the legal medical cannabis system and how to access medical cannabis. So we do hope that you're going to join us again uh, to learn more about taking that important next step. So what we're going to do now is in the meantime, we're going to open up the floor uh, for a 20 minute question and answer session. Um, now, if your question does not get answered, uh, fear not, uh, please do reach out to webinar at Canvas RX and they will be happy to address your question. We want to make sure that, that everybody gets the information that they need. So let's see what our first question is here. Okay, uh, so I have a question from Kathy uh, and her question is, I've started taking CBD drops and I'm not having any effects from it at all. I'm still in a lot of pain daily and end up taking Percocets and still have pain. Is there a higher dosage or is it all the same? What are the differences if there are some? Then I'll speak to that, Barb. So, Kathy, thank you for writing in. We appreciate your question. With using CBD drops, we generally want to start all patients at a very, very low dose. Our mantra at Canadian Cannabis Clinics is start low and go slow. There is no need to rush the medication, but we also want to bring it along in an effective manner um, so that we do reach a therapeutic dose and begin addressing uh, the symptoms. Um, so it's very, very important from the outset of using medical cannabis to begin an effective journaling program. You need to be recording your use. You need to be able to report these things accurately when you come back to see your physician at follow-up. And these products, it's important that they're used the same way every time and with food on the stomach. So to Kathy, I would say, I think it would be great if she contacted our care team and just had a conversation about bringing sort of the, the ideas about how the, how the dosing can be moved forward. Absolutely. And, and this is why, um, and again, I know that you guys had a lot of questions about dosage. And, and what I've learned from my experience uh, in working with patients is that I've met patients who have the same set of symptoms using the exact same medication. Uh, one patient may respond very, very favorably, uh, where another patient may not. Uh, and I believe that that has to do really with the uniqueness of the endocannabinoid system within each of our bodies. And the diversity of the strain they're using. And the diversity of the strains that are being used. Um, mm -hmm. Again, when when we recommend uh, our patients starting on any uh, oil product, uh, whether it be a CBD or a THC product, uh, we do start with the smallest dosage possible, usually which is about 0.25 milliliters that we, we, we start with. Usually, uh, about four then, drops. Exactly, about four drops. And then over a period of several days, increase that. Uh, now, Jonathan mentioned journaling, and you will hear me harp on about journaling <laughs> all throughout this series, uh, because it is so important uh, and so, so helpful. Uh, and what we tell patients is that when you do start a new product, it's very important to um, keep mindful of what the product is that you've taken, how much you've taken of it, when you've taken it, uh, and also to monitoring what the effects are on those symptoms. Uh, and with usually um, within several weeks of journaling, a picture will emerge Indeed. of what, how much, and when. Uh, so those are the basics on dosages. Uh, again, if you do have dosage specific questions, please do reach out to our team because they're certainly going to be able to give you the individual advice that you need on that. So mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to our next prod, uh, next uh, question, which I think is also a really great one. Thank you so much. I'm seeing all of the questions coming in, and they're mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, so mm -hmm. thank you so much. Uh, and so our next question comes from Judy. Uh, and Judy says that she is searching for a product that will help with daytime pain while working. Uh, I don't want to feel groggy, groggy pardon me, uh, specifically interested in creams for uh, pain in the feet and maybe edibles or something to get me through the day. Since there are so many cannabis products online, not sure where to begin. I am a cannabis rookie and thankful that it's helping. I will field that, Barb. So, Judy, thank you very much for writing in. Um, there are a couple of interesting points there that I would speak to immediately. So for daytime grogginess, that is often attributable to a THC product. Absolutely. Right? Yes. And quite often, if a person switches over to a CBD product at the right dose and dosed properly through the day, they will very often get um, some of the therapeutic value that they're looking for without the grogginess often associated with, 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 with THC. 
Exactly, and that's where that difference between uh, THC and its psychoactive effects mm -hmm. and CBD um, with, with fewer to no instances of that psychoactive effect um, really makes the difference. Uh, CBD during the daytime, uh, and what's interesting is that this also sort of comes into the stigma issue and, and who, who is using cannabis. Um, because again, in my many years, I speak to people who are teachers, uh, who are parents of children, uh, who have jobs, and, and really they, they need to, as they've often said, just keep their wits about them. Yeah. Uh, and CBD uh, for daytime can be very, very helpful in terms of alleviating that pain. As well, it can be used really effectively topically for many people. CBD can be great, so apply directly to the feet, that might be another thing right there. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, so again, um, consider uh, products with CBD for daytime. Certainly, they can help alleviate um, or, or remove the factor of grogginess uh, being involved. Now, and I would just, oh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. I just wanted to add to that that uh, the importance of working with a healthcare provider and a clinic and working with product from a regulated source, such as a licensed producer, is the only way you're going to be assured that quality control and that consistency. Especially with CBD, because we are seeing a lot of um, products that are popping up uh, everywhere for sale online from independent or non-regulated sources, and especially with CBD, um, you know, and, and CBD, again, uh, is, is something that, that needs to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, we feel very strongly that if you are embarking on this journey of addressing symptoms, that doing it in conjunction with a, a physician that is educated and knowledgeable when it comes to prescribing such types of products. So yes, certainly you can order something online. Um, however, um, we would definitely encourage you to speak with a physician uh, and, and really talk about um, having access to products, again, that are standardized and, and regulated. And we were speaking about this not long ago. And the, the, the point we came up with was, I would not order my, say, ibuprofen from Craigslist coming out of BC, right? Exactly. So I'm not going to order my medical cannabis from an unregulated source from a product from a, a supplier I don't know. Exactly, and and that's really interesting because that sort of leads us to our, our next question that, that I saw coming up that I thought was very interesting, uh, and, and this question comes from Gail, uh, hmm. and Gail says I've heard a lot of different edible products such as gummies, hard candies, chewing gum, uh, etc. Why are they not legal for purchase? Uh, and I think that's a great question. I I I think. Um, and, and probably a lot of patients that I've spoken with over the years um, generally feel that things like gummies and candies and, and gum and, and even um, in many cases, let's say cookies or, or, or baked goods, those have generally been focused and marketed uh, right now towards the recreational user. Uh, so again, looking at um, perhaps a, a different focus uh, in terms of uh, really having a psychoactive effect uh, that is desirable. Um, Personally, most of the patients that I have spoken that I have spoken to over the years really feel strongly that cannabis as medication um, should really present as medicine. Um, we already deal with a large amount of stigma and legitimacy being a barrier. And I think if we want medicinal cannabis to really be taken seriously as a legitimate medicine, sometimes being presented, let's say, in the form of a candy or a gummy bear, uh, it may be counterproductive to that. Uh, again, it's not to say that gummies and hard candies and, and baked goods are, are, are not good, um, but we feel that, that for the pure medicinal user, uh, again, having something that comes in the form of an oil uh, or having something that comes from uh, inhaled cannabis by a vaporizer. Without uh, all the extra sugar and calories, because we don't use any other medication in the form of a brownie three times a day or anything else. So I think that that type of thing is a consideration too for some people, exactly. many people. And you were just saying, as uh, we're, we're mentioning too, in terms of the visual appeal um, with children, there is always a concern about cannabis and, 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 and children's access to cannabis. Uh, and unfortunately, there have been a few cases already documented where children did consume cannabis products, um, either a candy or a brownie, which can, especially for very young children with very small bodies, uh, can be extremely powerful um, because it was mistaken as, as a harmless uh, product. There's also the issue of standardization again and clear labeling. Um, any product that is marketed and consumed uh, must have a list of ingredients and potency levels. And unfortunately, to date, the small scale edibles producers, they haven't quite been able to demonstrate that they can do that. Um, now, certainly you are going to see an increase in these type of products as
as legalization commences, uh, but it is going to take some time. Um, you know, I, I always tell people we've been living under a hundred years of cannabis uh, prohibition, uh, and that is not undone in any short time. Uh, and, and that really brings us to another important, important discussion that we will be having very soon, because legalization is impending here in Canada uh, of recreational cannabis, and, and certainly that will have an effect on, on medical users. Uh, so that definitely is going to be a discussion that, that we'll be having in the near future. I think we should take this this uh, this uh, Kara's letter here. Yes, just... Kara. Uh, Kara has written in, and, and this is a very, very uh, mm -hmm. interesting question. So Kara says, I would like my daughter to try medical cannabis. She is 13 years old and was diagnosed with polyarticular juvenile rheumatoid arthritis when she was eight. Is there any information on the effects that cannabis could have on kids? Her doctors say there's nothing, but seeing as how it was quite difficult for doctors to sign my form to be assessed, I would like another opinion for my daughter's sake. So this is a great question, and, and I think that a large amount of the progression of cannabis activism uh, and cannabis accept, uh, acceptance who have been raising the awareness uh, of the effectiveness of CBD on their children. Um, the most famous case probably is a young girl by the name of Charlotte Figgy. Uh, and you may be familiar with the um, CNN doc documentary that Dr. Sanjay Gupta did. Three that, part series. Exactly, yeah. uh, that focused on her family. Uh, and in fact, the strain, uh, the, the plant Charlotte's Web is actually named for Charlotte herself. Uh, now her story was that she was diagnosed with um, Dravet syndrome, uh, which is a very, very invasive form of epilepsy where children may have um, 10, 40, 50 seizures hundreds, a day, yeah. hundreds a day. Uh, and her parents essentially, um, you know, again, were at the end of their rope. They had exhausted every uh, avenue that they had and were at the point where in many cases, and, and not just with epilepsy patients, where the medications that are used to treat it are so invasive uh, that they were having a very detrimental effect on her development. Uh, as well, too, looking at um, looking at um, as well what what happened with um, uh, with the use of cannabis with her, uh, and that was very interesting. And, and their challenges in terms of being able to access. Uh, so it's really been important um, the use of cannabis with children specifically in terms of of making it acceptable to talk about um, so really with development of young people and and cannabis it's one of those things where we again very, very strongly urge parents to have a conversation with their specialists, uh, with their GPs. Um, certainly, we have seen children who have been having seizure disorders, having great, taking great strides and having uh, certainly a reduction in the numbers of seizures, even specifically with CBD treatment only. Mm -hmm. uh, CBD treatment as well, because of its lack of or less of a psychoactive effect, um, is generally considered um, more safe. Uh, so again, it's not that we would rule out in any form um, using cannabis um, or having children use cannabis, uh, but certainly is, is a conversation that needs to be had with doctors and specialists. All right, so let's see here. We've got time for more questions, which is awesome. I'm just checking the time here. We've got a few minutes. Why do you select one, Barb? Would you like me to select one? Yes, please. Okay. They're coming in fast and furious now. <laughs> All righty. Uh, I'm going to go to Mimi's question. Uh, so Mimi says that she is unable to smoke or vape um, due to diverticulitis. Uh, now, um, uh, she has not been able to take oils as well uh, and was hoping that perhaps a tincture would work. Uh, and Mimi asked, why are tinctures not yet available to purchase uh, as they are in the U.S.? Yeah, and what a great question. And so, um, applied, uh, taken orally, but it'll be absorbed through the floor of the mouth very, very quickly because it's alcohol based. Right now, though, in Canada, only oils and cannabis products are cleared by Health Canada. Canada does operate independently from the United States, of course. And again, when we're talking about purchasing unregulated product, whether within Canada or from the United States or, South or elsewhere, there's a lot of concern to be had. There are potential a lot of dangers and pitfalls of, of, of purchasing unregulated medication, uh, which we've emphasized here a couple of times now. 
Um, but there are new products and, and delivery methods as in uh, getting them into the body, uh, transcutaneous patches, even suppositories and other types of things are currently in the works and will probably be coming down the, uh, down the old pipe in Canada before very long and coming into the market. So there are uh, topicals, creams, sublingual wafers, suppositories, decarb bud and add it to food. Lots and lots of options, Barb. Awesome. And I'm so happy that you mentioned decarbed bud, because I'm mm. sure to most of you that probably sounds like a foreign language. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the questions that we were asked was, why aren't more decarboxylated products available from licensed producers? Let's just explain that. So exactly. Decarboxylated <laughs> means activated cannabis. So you can take the cannabis, say, by mouth, and it's already activated. Whereas if you take dried cannabis and vaporize it, you have to heat it to get it into your body to create this decarboxylating or activating process. So I would probably say as well too that, you know, when you look at the, the medical cannabis industry, it, it really is so young. Uh, mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to um, get in just as it really began. Uh, and that was really only about five years ago. Uh, and what we're looking at now is that there has been such a growth and such an expansion, and there are now so many more options for patients uh, in terms of products, in terms of the forms of products. Uh, so with regard to decarboxylated product, uh, I know right now that there are only two licensed producers, three, thank you, John. Jonathan, who are carrying it, but I am fairly certain that even within the next 12 months, uh, you're likely going to see more and more options that have been decarbed. Uh, now, um, did you want to go into the process of how to decarboxylate? Well, I just wanted to speak to it very briefly, and I did there for a second, but literally it's just a process of heating up a product to knock part of the molecule apart. That's all it is. It's activating it so it becomes bioavailable to our endocannabinoid system in our body. Exactly. Yeah. And, and a, a good basic way of decarboxyl of decarbox. <laughs> Please help me on this, John. You're there. Decarboxylating. <laughs> Thank you, decarboxylating. Yeah. So many big words in cannabis. Uh, so the, really, the most basic form, as most people have always used it, is rolling a cigarette or a joint and smoking it. That act of heat and combustion is what creates that process uh, and basically kicks off the, the, um, the firing up of those medicinal molecules, let's say. So let's see here, moving right along, I have a question from Kathy. Maybe this will be the last one. We're just coming down to we're the end here. We're coming down to the wire here. So All we're right. going to pick Let's take Kathy. But you know what? This is a really common question, and, and it's one that I, yeah. I think is really important because I think anybody who has used cannabis yep. has probably had this experience. Uh, so Kathy wants to know, she says she is a new user for about a month, uh, and she says, I am experiencing major dry mouth at night, and it is very annoying. <laughs> And I'd like to speak to that one. This is very, very common. Dry mouth, dry eyes. It has this, uh, this effect on the body very commonly. However, not all strains and all products will produce it equally in all people. That's Some right. people, this will escape them completely. But it is very common. And what to do about it is not necessarily the easiest answer. There are the simple things like having a warm beverage with you when you're vaporizing. There are ideas such as Barbara sometimes employs where she'll have a, a water vaporizer going in the room to moisturize the air in which she is medicating. And that's an interesting way to go about it. Very helpful. Um, but again, there are other little things that some people use that they find very helpful. There's a, a, um, a product line called Biotene. And Biotene has mouthwash and toothpaste and gum that are like, um, um, they, 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 they moisturize the mouth and they can be really, really effective to counter the immediate effects of that dry mouth. Now, of course, there are drops for dry eyes and things like that, which can lubricate. But again, the importance of journaling. If you're getting really bad dry mouth, dry eyes, the importance of journaling, again, speaks to the very important um, ability to report that back to the doctor when we come back. Hydration in general, just being Lots well hydrated, Lots right? Keeping the Absolutely. water going into us is very key for just general health and well-being. Keeping water with you at night so you're, you're, you're hydrating through the night. And consider breathing exercises. This is fantastic. In through the mouth, out through the nose, etc. So yeah, those are some ideas. Absolutely. So thank you so much. Uh, this yeah, is thanks everyone to, uh, for writing in. Yes, absolutely. This was so exciting and we look so forward to doing more of these. Uh, so this concludes the Q&A session. Uh, this webinar will be made available online for you all to listen to again. Uh, I believe it's going to go to YouTube. Uh, so we hopefully should be able to send you a link with that. Uh, our next one is going to be July 4th. Uh, and we are going to be again addressing how to 
access medical cannabis. If you are looking for more information in the meantime, or your question hasn't been answered, and again, thank you so much. I see so, so many of them there. Uh, please do feel free to reach out to our patient care team at webinar at canvasrx.com, and they'll be happy, happy to assist you with your questions. Um, again, for myself, Barbara Mullen, and uh, for Jonathan, thank you so, so much for joining us, and we wish you all the best of health, and uh, look forward to seeing you next time on July the 4th. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.